gives me great pleasure to, um, uh, to welcome uh, Jonathan Spicer uh, to, uh, to give us a talk today. Um, many of you know John Spicer. Um, he's uh, originally from, uh, from Montreal. He's, uh, he did his medical school and after a brief sojourn in the University of British Columbia, came back to McGill for, uh, to do the surgical scientist program um, in general surgery and a PhD in, uh, in cancer immunology. After this, he went to MD Anderson um, uh, for a fellowship in thoracic surgery and uh, joined us back at McGill in 2005. Uh, John's really taken the reins in, uh, in, in uh, lung cancer. He, he heads the lung cancer uh, program at the MUHC and really um, uh, both um, uh, provincially, uh, nationally, and now uh, globally has really taken, um, uh, taken um, uh, a leadership role in operable lung cancer. Really look forward to uh, uh, Spice, uh, John Spicer's uh, talk on um, on immunotherapy, um, and he's really uh, he's had a uh, instrumental role uh, in in providing uh, one of the um, uh, the most significant um, uh, new uh, changes in operable lung cancer the past twenty years. So, John, I really look forward to your talk, and I uh, can't wait to uh, we'll we'll have questions at the end for um, that we should be able to um, uh, address, John. Thanks, Renzo. Appreciate it. I really, um, it's a, it's, uh, I'm excited to present to, uh, to these grand rounds and to all of you today. Um, uh, I guess I'll start by saying that um, everything I'm talking about here is really a product of a huge team and enormous support from uh, an amazing university and, and department and a huge interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, of which I'm very proud because I think that we've, we've managed to make a difference for patients. And I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, these are my disclosures. So uh, this was the cover of Science back in 2013. I don't think uh, cancer immunotherapy is really a, a, a new concept to, to most of the people uh, attending today. Um, it's really revolutionized the way we care for almost every uh, type of uh, cancer. Um, and it's really based on the concept that um, cancers find some way to appease our immune system's normal functions, which should um, act towards uh, clearing out these abnormal cells. Uh, and checkpoint blockade is one of the many immunotherapeutic strategies, but the, the one that's come to the forefront to um, address this, uh, this um, phenomenon and, and it's, it really leverages the incredible specificity of our immune system to target uh, uh, foreign um, uh, living beings like cancer cells. And so um, I remember reading this, uh, this is just before leaving or in the midst of my fellowship and not necessarily appreciating at that time just how much it was going to impact our, our own practice as surgeons. Um, but, um, and I was also quite naive to everything that was going around in the world of oncology on this subject. Um, but I'll, I'll just try and give you sort of a, a bird's eye view of some of the things that, that uh, and some of the ways it's impacted and impacting our practice. The notion of systemic therapy for operable lung cancer is not a new concept. I think this is germane to almost every uh, form of cancer that we operate on. Um, we realize that more often than not, it's a systemic disease. And by adding some sort of systemic therapy, in this case, chemotherapy, we improve outcomes, uh, certainly more so in, in the locally advanced stages. And um, this was a philosophy that was imparted upon me during uh, my residency training and then even more so in, in fellowship. Um, this was probably the first paper to show a significant effect of perioperative chemotherapy for uh, stage three lung cancer and was let out of MD Anderson. Um, it was a, a trial that had to be stopped at interim analysis because of the extreme benefit of the experimental arm. And it wasn't an accidental finding, even though the numbers are low, it was reproduced by the Spanish group, uh, which is a collaborative group uh, done right around the same time when both these studies published within a year of each other. Um, now, despite that, um, the um, landscape for operable lung, lung cancer has remained dominated by um, surgery alone as, as the primary modality of therapy and in fact, upfront surgery. So the concept of getting some sort of systemic therapy before uh, the operation didn't really take off. 
there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, chemotherapy on its own is not the most effective treatment at downstaging. So it, it didn't historically have an impact on the conduct of the operation. Some patients might not have made it to the operation, to the operating room. So there's really this um, idea that the sooner the patient gets resected, the better, um, and that this would lead to, to optimal outcomes and that you could look after the uh, systemic uh, treatment issues in, in the post-operative phase. Now we know lung surgery tends to be a morbid intervention and a lot of patients feel like their disease is cured and sometimes their, their surgeons tell them that they're done and that there's nothing more that it needs to be done. And so the desire of patients to go on to post-operative chemotherapy in the lung space has been historically low. So even in as late as 2012, um, as many as half the patients would not, who met indications for the systemic chemotherapy would not go on to receive it. And that those numbers haven't changed all that much in, in more recent uh, uh, looks at the data. Uh, this is one, one such uh, effort that's just looking at basic, basically from 2016 to 2019, showing that anywhere from a third to half of patients who need indication, which would be the stage 1Bs to 3Bs that are resected, um, do not go on to get anything other than surgery. There's only one trial that has looked at comparing the notion of giving preoperative chemotherapy versus upfront surgery. You can imagine that at least uh, when, at the time this was being done, uh, cruel to this type of trial would have been quite difficult. It took them, I think, almost eight years to, to reach their uh, target number, and they didn't really see any significant difference between patients who had upfront surgery um, and those who, who had preoperative chemotherapy. Um, what was clear, however, is that there was no harm incurred by the um, pre uh, administration of preoperative therapy. And if anything, there was a signal to slight improvement. Um, now, when I think of a patient who's coming to the clinic who has a four or five, six centimeter tumor who may have lymph nodes that are involved, um, I, I look at these data, which are recent trial grade, phase three trial grade data that, have, that are contemporary from a trial called the Alchemist trial. Um, and in this trial, the goal was to assign patients to post-operative chemotherapy with or without immunotherapy. But this is the first publication looking at um, guideline concordant surgery uh, and administration of guideline concordant care in these, in these patients. We don't have the outcomes of the plus or minus immunotherapy um, treatment cohorts, but they looked at 2,800 patients who were resected and stage eligible for um, adjuvant chemotherapy. And in these patients, only 57 actually, 57% went on to get uh, any form of adjuvant chemo. Um, only 44% got four cycles, and only 34% got the guideline concordant cisplatin based chemo. So, despite our best efforts in the contemporary era where most patients are operated by a minimally invasive approach, may have accelerated recovery programs to reach intended care, um, it's only a, a small fraction that actually make it to, to, to these subsequent elements of care, which we know are important to improving outcome. Now, um, when I came out of uh, fellowship and started uh, uh, on staff here about seven years ago, um, I was uh, interested in looking at how we could add immunotherapy, which had proven itself in the um, space of, um, sorry, I don't mind, maybe you guys can mute yourselves if your mics are on, um, which had proven itself in this context of uh, stage three and four disease. Um, and we were looking at seeing how- Sorry, Gabriella, do you mind uh, muting yourself? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, uh, we were looking to see how we could incorporate uh, the benefits of immunotherapy, which were proven in, in stage, uh, inoperable stage three and stage four patients into the earlier stages. And I remember, uh, writing a proposal and sent it to one of the more prominent companies at the time to see innocently, not really realizing all the work that was being done globally uh, on the subject. Um, and of course, I, I got no response uh, for, for a better part of a year. Um, and in 2018, I, I understood 
better why no one was answering my calls to, to do this kind of work. It's because it was being done and had already been started well before in 2014 by uh, the team at Johns Hopkins University, which was really led the way uh, in terms of immunotherapy for lung cancer, having done most of the pivotal trials. Now, this was a small trial. They only had 20 patients. Um, they accrued them over the better part of three years. Um, three or four years, and it was in collaboration with Sloan Kettering. But what struck everyone was that 45% of those 20 patients had what was called a major pathological response after only two doses of uh, nivolumab, which is an immune checkpoint uh, PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, historically, patients who'd received chemotherapy three or four cycles worth would have maybe 15% incidence of uh, major pathological response, which corresponds to fewer than 10% uh, residual viable cells in the, in the primary tumor. So these two doses, which are far less uh, toxic than any amount of chemotherapy, um, really had a dramatic impact. And this was in a cohort of patients who were totally unselected from a biomarker standpoint. They took all comers. So I think this woke everyone up. It was published in the England Journal. Uh, maybe this is, a, is going to be a very important part of our practice. In parallel to that, there were a number of surgical publications indicating that operating on patients who had received immunotherapy, usually uh, in an oligometastatic setting, was extremely uh, challenging, difficult, that there was uh, much more hyalur fibrosis leading to challenging, risky operations. And so I think as a community, uh, the thoracic surgical community was, was sort of reticent to, to embrace this. The, despite that, there were other phase two trials that uh, produced uh, interesting, compelling results. This is one out of Columbia, led by a medical oncologist named Kathy Shu, where they combined um, uh, chemotherapy with the tezolizumab, which is an anti pdl one uh, inhibitor. Um, now, this is an academic trial with a great surgical team, 97% of those um, I forget how many, maybe 20 or 30 patients made it to the operating room. They had a high complete resection rate. And in this case, 57%. So even more than the, um, than the nivolumab alone uh, arm had a, a major pathological response. And you can see that almost half had no residual tumor. So 100% means they couldn't see any cancer cells in the resected specimen. And usually the protocols to examine the specimens are extremely detailed where everything was submitted in total with you know, numerous slides per block uh, submitted and examined by the pathologist. It's a painstaking uh, effort for the pathologist to look at these kinds of um, section specimens. Probably the most influential phase two trial has been, again, from the Spanish cooperative group. When I see what they've done in Spain, it, 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 it gives me hope that we can do some really amazing things in Canada as well. But essentially, it's a multi-center trial looking at patients with stage three. They recruited 44 patients, and these patients got a combination of chemotherapy and nivolumab. And in this case, 83% had a major pathological response and 63% had, had a pathological complete response, which is striking. That's not nearly two thirds of the patients who had no residual cancer resection. And it's a small number. There's only five patients here who didn't make it to surgery, but you can see some who are going way out uh, quite far with no evidence of um, progression or recurrence or death. Um, so were these patients possibly cured with the treatment, the systemic treatment alone? I suppose time will tell. Now, uh, leveraging a lot of these findings, there was a, a trial which we were very fortunate to be involved with. And this was uh, thanks to um, Vera Hirsch, who is a, a senior medical oncologist who just retired a year or two ago, um, who was asked to be um, a site PI here. And she's kind enough to, to asked me if I would do it. Um, she was quite busy with a number of other things. And this was with me just being two years out of practice. So an incredible amount of uh, trust uh, that was handed over and to someone who had zero uh, trial experience. So I unbelievably fortunate to have been given this opportunity. And, um, but it, it was uh, at the time, this was uh, late 2016. Um, again, this, to, to the, with the same company that was not answering my uh, my grant requests. And again, I understood why, because they were planning an international phase three trial. 
looking at this. And, and the original design of the trial wasn't in fact looking at chemotherapy and nivolumab versus chemotherapy alone as it's published here, but was looking at a combination of two immunotherapeutic agents, an anti-PD-1 and an anti-CTLA-4 in combination. So it was nivolumab and ipilimumab versus chemotherapy. And what they were really trying to show is whether a chemo-free regimen was going to be comparing favorably to that. Um, the results of those phase two trials that I've shown you just previously emerged mid accrual and led to some protocol amendments. And uh, the, the third arm of chemotherapy and nivolumab was added sort of mid. Uh, for for uh, a variety of reasons, but um, Essentially, this led to, uh, to this uh, trial, um, which, um, was, uh, which I'll tell you about in a couple moments. But uh, again, just to give you a sense of the uh, faith and trust that, that came through from, from uh, a multidisciplinary group here at the MUHC, uh, this was the first patient that we enrolled. I apologize, the pictures are a little bit fuzzy. But he was a, an elderly gentleman, I think he was 78 or 79 at the time. Um, he was a, a donor to Cedars. Um, he, he was well connected and he had this very large mass in the right upper lobe. Um, at that time, I was just two years in practice. And I think a lot of places, uh, um, surgeons aren't given as many opportunities as they're given here at McGill. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, the support of the patient knew Dr. Mulder and uh, Dr. Mulder was happy to uh, encourage the patient to participate in this trial. And he happened to be randomized to the immunotherapy alone arm. He was the first patient globally recruited, which actually uh, put our name on the map in terms of uh, being able to do this kind of work. Um, uh, and <laughs> he, he had this very large mass, got the three treatments of immunotherapy, fortunately no complications. And at the post-treatment scan, it almost looked like the thing got better. You can see these little PA branches that are in a mess of inflammatory tissue here. The thing is abutting the trachea. It literally looked like it got bigger. And when I, I resected him, fortunately he did okay. He had hardly any response at all. So really, uh, after that experience, I was wondering, what the hell are we doing here? Um, but we, we pressed on and ended up recruiting quite a number of patients. Uh, in fact, the most of any uh, site of the 150 sites that were uh, participating globally. And these are the results. So in fact, this is, this is the result that missed its statistical uh, uh, benchmark. It's a trial that was powered for not overall survival, but event-free survival, which is defined as not making it to surgery, having a recurrence or death from any cause uh, after enrollment. And the second primary endpoint was pathological complete response. So the notion of having no residual tumor cells in the primary or lymph node, uh, dissected lymph nodes. Overall survival is to be tested hierarchically if both primary endpoints were, were uh, to come back positive. This is all stuff that I've learned in the last few years. I never learned this in medical school or uh, doing a PhD or in residency. Uh, but uh, medical oncologists are quite um, precise and, uh, and, and they're sticklers about these kinds of things. I think it's because their drugs uh, cost a fortune and, and payers uh, want to see really um, uh, rigorous data. But to me, this uh, statistically insignificant uh, finding is dramatic and clinically extremely significant. We have a 12% incremental benefit in survival, overall survival at 12 years, with a p-value of 0 0.008 after the alphas chewed up for the two primary endpoints, which were positive. Uh, the, the benchmark for, for this being statistically positive was uh, less than P of 0 0.003, uh, which is insane. And you can see that the uh, confidence interval here is for 99.67. So in my mind, this is wildly positive and it also incorporates the notion that uh, the majority of patients got chemotherapy, which we know adds about 5% benefit. And as I have overall survival, and as I was indicating to you um, earlier, if patients get upfront surgery, they are relatively unlikely to get post-operative treatment at all. Um, so this regimen uh, brings a lot of
potential benefits to our patients. But on to the actual uh, primary endpoints of the study, which are the, one, are the ones that are, uh, you know, the main ones of interest, I suppose, for most of the community, is that uh, pathological response, complete response was wildly positive. It's a 14-fold difference. About 24% of the patients had a pathological complete response versus 2.2%. Um, these were uh, assessed by blinded independent review. Um, the numbers are lower than what we've seen in the phase two trials, which is not uncommon. Um, but that's also true for the control arm, where you might expect it from historical uh, studies, sorry, uh, historical studies, a uh, rate of five to seven percent uh, with chemo alone. Um, in terms of event-free survival, we had almost uh, 20 points in difference um, at two years, which corresponds to uh, about 11 months of extra life, a median uh, event-free survival um, in the uh, experimental arm versus the control arm. So again, a very significant uh, finding. And I think this is really what um, has people saying that this is one of the most uh, significant um, improvements in uh, the care of patients who undergo a surgery for lung cancer in, in the better part of 20 years. Because really our efforts as surgeons in the last uh, little while has been focused on reducing morbidity. There's very little that we've been doing in the operating room that's changing the long-term survival of, of patients. Um, we try and take out all the disease and do it in the least morbid way. But now with these new agents, we're, we're really making a difference. This is a subgroup analysis, which I, I won't bore you with, but uh, essentially across subgroups, there seem to be trends to, uh, to, be, to benefit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can orient our treatments in a more specific way. It's important to realize this is a non-biomarker directed trial. All the patients were included, provided they had a T clinical TNM staging that was consistent with the eligibility criteria. Um, in terms of adverse events, I think this is another important finding from the trials that the addition of this extra anti-cancer agent did not incur any additional uh, toxicities, which is, again, unusual. So you have rates of uh, grade three, four adverse events that are uh, almost identical between the two cohorts. Um, discontinuation treatment is not, not really different. And uh, for me... Um, one of the most important findings as a surgeon uh, is, is the surgery-related adverse events. Uh, so there's a high-quality data collected by uh, CTCA uh, criteria, um, and we have a grade 3, 4 uh, uh, complication rate that's surgery-related of 11.4%, uh, which is actually comparable to what I quote my patients undergoing a vaxlobectomy for a stage one lung cancer. And these patients had much more advanced disease, many had pneumonectomies or complex resections. But usually for a stage one vaxlobectomy, we quote about a 10% grade three, four complication rate. So evidently there's something happening with this treatment that is enabling surgery that is less morbid, which is again, something that's never been demonstrated before. There's some questions about administering these treatments to patients with earlier stage lesions that might be cured by surgery alone. And I think the concerns are reasonable. Um, most of the effect is driven by stage three patients, which represent about two thirds of the cohort. Um, there's no evident harm incurred by the uh, addition of OMAB in the stage two patients, um, stage one B and two patients, but uh, it remains to be determined if there's really great gains over chemotherapy alone. Uh, I think time will tell. Usually patients with these earlier stage lesions will have fewer events <clears throat> or may take more time to reach an event. And so maybe a more mature data will give us a better idea. It's also small cohorts of patients with these uh, lower stage arms. So we may be missing an effect uh, just due to lack of statistical power. Uh, what gives me uh, some uh, faith to push into the earlier stages with these kinds of treatments is that the degree of pathological response was not really influenced uh, by the uh, burden of disease. So you see high rates of pathological response in the chemo nivolumab arm versus chemo alone across stages 1B, 2A, 2B, and 3A. Um, and this data, which indicates that if you do achieve a pathological complete response rate, you're much more likely to have a uh, event 
prolonged event-free survival as compared to someone who doesn't have a complete response. So um, we know that the most common cause of death in even stage one lung cancer patients is uh, recurrent or metastatic lung cancer. So if there's a way to incur a pathological complete response prior to resection, I think it, it, should, be, um, it should be taken. Um, in terms of subsequent therapies, this is, I think, quite relevant to payers and, and, and our patients, obviously. The rate of any further therapy is half in the patients who have, uh, in the two-year uh, follow-up period, in the, in the control, and sorry, in the treated patients over the chemotherapy alone arm with only 21% requiring any further therapy versus 43.6% in the chemotherapy alone group. How did this impact surgery? So uh, again, this is, I think the first time we see some sort of preoperative intervention having a beneficial effect on the, on the uh, conduct of surgery. And this is in a community of surgeons and a practice of surgery that is notoriously um, conservative and uh, one where uh, the intervention minimally invasive adoption has been extremely slow. And also where there's a, a dogma to resect the disease at first presentation rather than to tailor the operation to, uh, to, the, to the radiographic response. But um, in terms of the data we have, and the, patient, it, the effects seem to be most notable in the stage 3A patients, which is understandable because this, these are patients with the heaviest burden of disease who might need the most extensive resections who may be approached by an open technique more frequently. But you see a relatively uh, striking reduction in the in, uh, need for open surgery in the chemo nevo group. Another thing I learned running these trials is we're not allowed to put any p values or do any kind of statistical analysis on these secondary exploratory outcomes because this was an FDA registered trial. And if you do that, it's, uh, it's uh, creates some sort of perception that, that you're um, massaging the data. And so the only uh, things that are eligible for that kind of statistical analysis, which we do on a routine basis for all of our work in surgery and uh, with much lower quality data, um, uh, is not permitted uh, by, for, by the regulatory agencies. So uh, I don't know if this is statistically significant, but it looks clinically important to me. There was about half as many uh, conversions to open um, in the stage three patients. And, and we know that conversion is usually a uh, sort of dramatic event in the operating room, usually for urgent uh, bleeding issues. Um, so that's uh, an important aspect of improving patient safety through the trajectory. <clears throat> we also know that pneumonectomies are, are bad and they're associated with uh, poor outcomes. Um, and there was uh, almost a uh, 40 to 45% reduction in uh, the amount of pneumonectomies needed for these stage 3A patients, uh, which is, uh, we know just based from uh, tons of uh, surgical data that that's, that's a good thing. What was very interesting was to look at this incredible diversity of surgical practice. I don't think I've ever seen um, one protocol generating data on surgery on the lung from numerous uh, geographic regions. Um, and so that's one area where, where we'll hope to dig in a little bit more on this data. It's hard to get it out of the hands of the company, but they seem to be willing to collaborate. Um, but you can see here, just in terms of the use of minimally invasive uh, surgery, much more common in uh, Asia than Europe. And this is true regardless of the treatment uh, employed. The use of, uh, I didn't highlight it here, but the use of pneumonectomy was quite different. So although in the, and this is weird, in the nivolumab and chemotherapy treated patients, it was all more or less in the same range. But in Europe, the ones who got chemo alone, and this is one of the challenges of an open label trial, people, surgeons may be quite influenced, but 40% of the patients had uh, a pneumonectomy, which is a very high rate of pneumonectomies. The other weird and concerning finding is the R0 section. So R0 indicates complete uh, um, uh, microscopically negative margin uh, resection. And the North American cohorts had very low R0 resection rates, 64% versus 89 and 90% in Europe and Asia. And same in the chemotherapy arm. Is this because 
North American pathologists don't like their surgeons and, and uh, find margins where there are none? Or is it because the people in Europe and Asia are making up stories or are, are the surgeons better in Europe and Asia versus the ones in North America? I don't know. But this is uh, a very striking finding that means further assessment and probably more international global level data to, to really understand the diversity of practice in play. Um, in terms of length of stay, this is another example of wildly different uh, finds. It's not, probably not news to, to our group here in uh, McGill, where uh, we've been very interested in this metric for just the purpose of getting all our patients looked after. <clears throat> but there are cultural uh, and dogma differences depending on region. You can see that in the whole cohort, there's no difference between the two, court, the two treatment groups. Uh, like this day, 10 days per group. Uh, however, in um, when looked at per region, you have almost two days less in the chemo nevo treated uh, patient versus chemo alone. Uh, again, an important effect of preoperative therapy on the surgical conduct uh, and outcomes for our patients. I didn't highlight it here, but this was a remarkably safe regimen. Um, 90 day mortality for the Nevo chemo uh, treated patients was 2.8%. Quoted 90 day mortality for lobectomy um, is somewhere between 4 and 6%. If you look at the STS uh, general thoracic surgery database, so same would be, would be the same for the ESTS. And for pneumonectomy, it's upwards of 9 to 11%. So very favorable outcomes. Obviously, these were fit patients eligible for trial inclusion. Um, but reassuring that the treatment was incurring harm. There are already a real world uh, data on the subject. This is out of the Shanghai Pulmonary Hospital, which is probably the busiest thoracic surgery hospital in the world. Um, and they uh, treated 76 patients with chemo uh, immunotherapy, either pembrolizumab or bolumab, which are more commonly employed in therapeutic anti-PD-1 agents in the market. Um, most patients only had two cycles in Checkmate 816. So the patients were destined to get um, uh, three cycles. And in fact, 94% of the patients received uh, all three uh, treatments in the, in the chemo and bone map arm. So it's very well tolerated regimen. But here, probably for cost reasons or who knows what, most had two cycles. And, this, and uh, over 80% had very bulky advanced disease, stage 3A or 3B. This is the most advanced disease that anyone would consider operating on. And in a lot of places around the world, people don't operate on this disease because they, they, they feel it's um, not indicated. Um, but and these are also amazing surgeons. 72% of these very enormous tumors were operated by minimally invasive technique with low conversion rates. And you see the pathological response waterfall plots here showing dramatic rates of pathological complete response, which um, corroborate the findings of the trial. The other interesting thing that um, uh, these uh, surgeons did is they tried to quantify what was the planned operation versus what was the executed operation. These are data that are missing uh, from, uh, from Checkmate A16. In fact, many of the other phase three trials that are coming through the pipeline are missing that because surgeons have not been engaged in the process of designing these trials. I kind of came on by uh, fortune and uh, interest, but um, when I went to the PI meeting in uh, 2017, uh, I, I uh, had a bad case of imposter syndrome because I was the only surgeon in the room with an all medical oncologist. And it was at that time that I realized uh, all well, started to realize how uh, uh, unique it was for a surgeon to be a site PI for this kind of study. I think we need to be more engaged in these things because we are uh, the primary doctors for these patients. Um, but uh, it was it was a very uh, eye opening to see that uh, there are a lot of political reasons why America and Europe medical oncologists are, are leading these efforts. But we're, we're we're losing opportunities to capture really important data for our patients and for our own practice. Uh, but yeah, unless we, we be, get really engaged in the construction of these and and the and the data acquisition of these studies, but all that to say that. It, it, this is retrospective data, but it did seem that um, the preoperative treatment led to operations that were less invasive uh, and fewer pneumonectomies being performed, again, corroborating the findings of Checkmate 816. It's interesting to note that the first 
pulmonary surgery for lung cancer using individual hilary ligation of the lung was done actually here at the MUHC at the time at the Royal Victoria Hospital by uh, Edward Archibald. Um, these are morbid operations. Um, uh, this is what it looks like nowadays, patient with a left pneumonectomy and intraperiodontal dissection. We try and avoid doing this as much as possible because we know the outcomes are not great. This is a study led by the Sloan Kettering Group showing that non-oncologic mortality from pneumonectomy is significantly higher than from lumpectomy. A number of reasons for that. Um, and uh, the main is the main ones that the patients are more likely to die, say, of pneumonia, an MI, uh, there's uh, impact on the on cardiovascular function, there's higher risks of uh, stroke in these patients. <clears throat> so if we can avoid pneumonectomies, we can. It's very interesting that this preoperative treatment enabled that. Um, and more and more, what I find most uh, uh, stimulating from a surgical standpoint is that these treatments are pushing us to do more and more interesting uh, pulmonary preserving um, operations. Again, data from the Shanghai Pulmonary Hospital where they looked at uh, patients who underwent either pneumonectomy or some kind of sleeve uh, lobectomy or sleeve sort of reconstruction of either uh, the bronchus or um, uh, pulmonary artery or both. And what was fascinating in their data is to see that over time, they adopted more and more sleep resections, but that there was uh, an era, time era uh, effect in terms of complications. So the blue is the later era and the red is the uh, earlier era, indicating that uh, you know, it takes time to learn how to do these operations safely for patients. Um, so volume is important and um, good teams that know how to look after and, and conduct these complicated operations are available. And that, that seemed to translate at least in terms of survival with the later year having better uh, overall survival and probably in this, uh, with this kind of analysis, recurrence-free survival being more pertinent, uh, indicating that the operations <clears throat> were uh, more effective from an oncologic standpoint. Um, we also now have phase three data showing that video assisted resection is superior to lobectomy. The primary endpoint from this British run study was in terms of quality of life, uh, was sort of a significant impact on improved quality of life. This was most notable early postoperatively uh, with equalization of the two arms over time, but the cumulative health uh, uh, impact of, of the operation was less than conducted by newly based of operation. So any treatment that gives and preoperatively that enables that is a good thing. This is a, a patient who was treated with uh, chemonivolumab just very recently. She was a one-year-old patient. Um, she had an anoplasma. Not sure if the mic is on, but uh, you guys can mute yourselves. Um, Lashanda, I'll mute you. There you go. Um, no, I'll mute you again. Um, so, uh, yeah, this patient had an endocarcinoma, had a low PDL1, which is a marker of, uh, of uh, the uh, ligand uh, for, for the checkpoint blockers. She um, uh, had a locally advanced tumor, uh, so you can see it here budding on the interlobar PA. Um, it was stages T3 and 1. She had good lung function. Um, we decided to put her on one of our trials here because this treatment's not yet available, even though it was FDA approved in the, in the US. In fact, FDA approved before the study was even published, which is a first to my knowledge. Um, and unfortunately, she was only able to receive two doses of treatment um, because she developed COVID after the second dose. She was only mildly symptomatic. We let her recover. <clears throat> and the advice from the medical monitor for the trial was to forego the third dose and go on to surgery. You saw from the Chinese data, there was a good chance she might have had a complete response. She had a restaging PET, which shows that there's almost more activity than there was before. And that's maybe because glucose hungry uh, immune infiltrates have made their way into the tumor. Uh, could also be because the tumors progressed on treatment, though that's quite uncommon. And this is a, a short video of the operation. I had the fortune of having uh, Sarah Nash may help me with this because it was very challenging. Here we are taking the um, pulmonary vein. And uh, as we're dissecting, we feel that uh, there may be a way to do uh, what's called a, 
a double sleeve. This is all done under videoscopic guidance for getting distal control here on the um, interlobar PA, which was dissected. Now we're getting uh, control on the uh, inferior pulmonary vein for outflow control. And you can see uh, up here, uh, clamp on, here we go, we're clamping the uh, left main PA. So now that we have uh, inflow and outflow control, uh, this is the uh, part where you might want to be wearing a diaper. And for those who haven't seen intraoperative PA bleed, this is sort of what it looks like, except it keeps going and it's much more uh, 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 frightening when there are no clamps uh, proximal or distal. Um, but here we are uh, dividing the interlobar PA. Um, then, so that's done. And here we are opening the proximal PA. You can see the clamp there. I always uh, worry that the clamps aren't on correctly when, when we do this. Uh, there's still so much blood that's coming. Um, and so this is, I think, anyways. So, and then we had to divide the bronchus. And so this is the reconstruction. I'm pretty sure this is the first uh, double sleeve done in uh, McGill, probably in Quebec probably in, in Canada, I think there's only a handful of surgeons globally who've, who've actually done this. Um, but uh, whether it's the right or wrong thing is, uh, we'll chat about in a moment. But she ended up having um, a decent uh, post-operative experience. This is a painstaking thing to, to do the, the anastomosis by bats, but with uh, good help, uh, which I was fortunate to have, it, it, uh, it can be done. That's the lung coming up. Um, this is the vascular anastomosis, which is also um, quite difficult to do, but uh, with, with some patients can be done. And uh, clamps coming off lower later here. So that's the operation. So they're fun operations. They push us to do more. This is for x-ray two weeks post. Um, so I'm very pleased to preserve your lung, but uh, I uh, am stressed for this patient. Uh, I don't have the final uh, report on a pathology. I've had multiple conversations with a pathologist. Um, and although we did a fancy operation and saved her from a pneumonectomy, this would have been an easy left pneumonectomy. It would have been easy to get wide, wide margins on this. So did we actually do the patient a favor um, by doing this fancy operation? Does the fact that we did a uh, reduced extent to resection really mean that she's going to have an improved outcome? Um, this remains to be determined. And in fact, depending on how extensive her response is, we have some decisions to make about how to tailor her post-operative treatment. We now know um, that the uh, overall survival of these patients has improved. This is three-year data from the Nadim trial, which I mentioned to you uh, earlier. Uh, it's really remarkable. Patients who received all uh, elements of the treatment plan had 91% survival at three years, unheard of for stage three. Um, and the uh, intent to treat analysis, 70% had no evidence of recurrence, which is uh, also dramatic. Usually in stage three, survival at three years is anywhere from 25 to 50%. Looks like ctDNA is an interesting way of predicting uh, outcome. Uh, so patients who had complete resolution of circulating tumor DNA after completion of the adjuvant therapy had much better uh, survival. And this was associated with a hazard ratio of 0.26, which is fairly impressive. I think one of the things that we've been able to do here at McGill, and this is thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Carley and his team, is combine the adjuvant therapy with, um, with uh, prehabilitation. And we no longer have this competing interest of unchecked cancer progression and poor surgical fitness that we know can be improved upon with prehab. This early data from our group showing that patients who get prehab have much shorter lengths of stay. So now we really try to approach patients with this strategic idea that um, if we combine, rather than rushing to the operating room, maybe they're still smoking, maybe their diabetes is out of control, they're nutritionally uh, uh, not uh, optimized, we can take our time, get them on a highly active form of anti-cancer treatment, get them into a prehab program so they come to surgery in the best possible condition. And this is, I really learned this uh, from Lorenzo and what he's done with the um, esophagus program, I think is an incredible amount to, to, that we learned from, from that, that work. So in our minds, uh, it's out with the old and in with the neo. 
there's a lot on the horizon. I'll just finish up with this. There's new data showing that um, minimally, sorry, less extensive resections, even for stage one, lead to better outcomes. This was a huge Japanese trial, over a thousand patients and included comparing lobectomy and segmentectomy, which is an anatomical sublobar resection. Um, in that trial, there was better survival, better overall survival, 94% versus 91% of the patients who had segmentectomy. And this is despite almost twice as many local recurrences. We're not exactly sure why they had this finding. Is it spurious? Is it a statistical accident? Or is it real? Does having more lung actually help you live longer and better? Well, even in the context of non-vital organ cancer surgery, surgical de-escalation is possible, and it's not a new concept. In breast cancer, it's been over a century that we've been de-escalating and reducing the impact of the operation. Um, and this has been largely due to combining uh, surgery with perioperative treatments. Here, this is a new adjuvant uh, or periadjuvant trial in breast cancer showing improved survival when pembrolizumab is a checkpoint inhibitors combined with chemotherapy. Now, if we were to target things and use actual biomarkers to uh, administer our treatments, we could reach even better outcomes. This is in, in colorectal cancer. Patients with MMR deficient early stage colon cancer were given immunotherapy before surgery and the complete response rate in the MMR deficient uh, patients was nearly 100% almost like a colitis that you could treat with a couple of medications. I'm not gonna go through the science, but now one of the challenges we're, um, we're having in the OR is uh, what to know, what to do, because the radiological uh, response is not predictive pathological response. Um, here's a patient we treated recently, 48 year old guy. He has this enormous mass. It's involving the SVC. Uh, the SVC is essentially replaced by tumor. This is a PET scan. He's got okay lung function, but he's certainly not good lung function for a pneumonectomy. He has an SVC syndrome. We treat him as unresectable stage three uh, and sort of get an authorization to get him on off protocol uh, chemoimmunotherapy. He gets four cycles, which he tolerates quite well. His, his ECOG actually improves. And this is, a, he has a partial response. Is there still cancer in here? You can see some necrotic stuff. Uh, I don't know, who knows? But he's got a lot of collateralization um, and uh, this is not an easy operation. Again, I was lucky to have uh, Dr. Najme with me with this. So we lost that liter of blood just opening the chest. Uh, we resected his SBC on block. We had nice things on the PA so we didn't have to do any angioplastic work there. Uh, there was no need for chest wall resection. We ample use of frozen section to confirm that we didn't need to take more. I thought for sure we would have to do a sleeve was not required because the frozen was negative. This post-op x-ray, he had a difficult post-operative course. In fact, it was complicated by a profound hypotension, <clears throat> unclear whether he had um, sepsis, but when we gave him some steroids, he improved and he may have had actual adrenal failure from the immunotherapy, which is a known uh, complication, but he eventually went home after a month and a half and he's well now. So did we have to do this operation? Well, maybe, maybe not. It was a morbid surgery, but when we looked at all that huge tumor under the microscope, it was just necrosis, inflammatory cells, and fibrosis. And he had a complete response in an eight, seven year necrotic bed. An amazing story. So what do we do about prediction? We need to understand better how to know what is actually happening inside our patients before we take them to the operating room. We're currently using multiplex molecular imaging to predict things. This is fancy imaging of very small pieces of tumor, which we can use uh, bioinformatic pipelines to uh, segment the cells. And this uh, work is actually um, being resubmitted to Nature. The uh, editors are kind enough to review it, and the reviewers are kind enough to ask for resubmission. We've demonstrated that with looking at just one square millimeter of resected tissue, we can predict progression at three years with an AUC of greater than 0.9 um, using this multiplex imaging technology. So uh, this is extremely promising for trying to predict other things. We've, this is a page paper that we're resubmitting to Cancer Discovery now uh, using the same technology and patients who have received or not received immunotherapy. Uh, we can characterize the cells that express certain uh, uh, cytokines. In this case, the XCL13 seems to be associated with response to immunotherapy. And we then looked at in a, in a in mouse cohorts showing that patient mice that were uh, known to be partially responsive to immunotherapy were 
more responsive when CXTL13 was added. Resistant cell lines were became sensitive when CXTL13 was added, but we still have these immune desert uh, patients, which as it happens, you, know, as you guys know I'm interested in neutrophils, seem to be dominated by neutrophil populations. So we have some ideas about how to make these, these uh, types of tumors uh, sensitive. And so we have work ongoing here uh, at McGill. This is a phase two trial, which we'll be opening this month, looking at earlier stage patients. So these are stage one and no negative 2A patients who will be getting preoperative immunotherapy with or without chemotherapy, going on to surgery. And we're allowing for segmentectomy because we think that de-escalating surgery is important. We're doing a bunch of analyses. Um, we're co collaborating with teams at a global level. This has been super exciting. This is a study that we did um, through about 20 centers internationally, looking at these novel agents like Lamamo and Elizabeth Dantyrson with different immunotherapies. Mm -hmm. uh, difficult trial to accrue to, but we were able to show that the addition of these two uh, drugs to uh, immunotherapy alone it increased the pathological response rate. And now we have another phase two trial that is sort of next generation immunotherapy combining chemoimmunotherapy with these drugs to see if we can further push the pathological complete response rate to the next level. Uh, lung cancer is exciting because there are a number of other non-immunotherapic uh, therapeutic targets that are becoming available. There's a ton of targeted therapies. They're just pills that patients can take. This is a patient during the COVID pandemic in the first few months who I put on an ALK uh, inhibitor. Uh, this was her tumor downstaged. We were able to plan the surgery in a delayed fashion. She had a near complete response and she had a back flow home day two. This is uh, another patient I operated on very recently. She had 10 centimeter tumor. You can see it on the x-ray here. She's 73 Haitian non-smoker, 10 centimeter tumor. She presents with a mop that says she's out of breath. Uh, next generation sequencing shows an EGFR mutation. We give her two months of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and you can hardly see the tumor on the x-ray. Her hemoptysis improved. We did VAT slow. This is her post-op x-ray. She had a path uh, near complete response. All the nodes are negative. She's doing great. So all this work is really thanks to an enormous team. We need teams of great surgeons, great oncologists, pathologists, pulmonologists who've identified patients who biopsy them appropriately. We need scientists to understand the work. Um, none of this is the work of one. It's been an enormous uh, um, privilege to work with such an amazing team here at McGill. Um, and so that's it. Happy to take uh, any questions you guys may have. Well, outstanding work, John. I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, I, I guess I'll start. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> John, there's like, as soon as you hit above 50 PCR, uh, then you start start to question um, the role of surgery. So, do you think we're we're even for early stage disease we're going to go in that direction? You sort of alluded to it with that eighty or that that, that massive tumor that was necrotic. So, where do you think we're we're moving in, in that direction? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think right now we we uh, have no way of predicting what's happening. Um, so, we will be compelled to operate for the foreseeable future. But you're right that. If we had a way of knowing, like if you can combine radi radiographic data with CT DNA data, and you know in that particular patient that's in front of you that there's a 90% chance or more that they have a complete response, I suppose you have to have at least the conversation of, of whether you should operate on them. I, I don't know the answer. I can tell you that in the Nadim trial, it's a small number, but those patients who had surgery in all elements of care were the ones with the best um, outcomes. They had, you know, 91% survival versus 82% or whatever for the, for the intent to treat. So is it because they had surgery or were they just fitter patients? Uh, I don't know. But what I do know is that we need to be part of this transformation and we need to be part of caring for these patients because I think early stage patients across all disease sites will continue to come see surgeons and the more we're a part of the decision-making and, and all that, I think the more our practice will remain relevant and interesting. I think we have time for one last question. We have one from Matt Rousseau. Uh, amazing work, John. Do you think regulatory agencies should consider non-traditional outcomes like surgical outcomes or even PRO in their uh, decision to approve medications regimes as opposed to just overall survival, I guess? 
Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, look, uh, we we spend millions of dollars for robots that have uh, like zero data to 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 demonstrate any kind of cost effectiveness or uh, reduction in perioperative outcomes. And here, uh, three doses of nivolumab is about twenty one thousand dollars. I think if you avoid a patient pneumonectomy, or if you can accelerate their recovery, return to work, or and that their care is done and in a sort of three or four months of treatment, that that's, that's pretty important stuff. And I, I, I think that only us as surgeons can, can collect that data and make that, those arguments. Um, it, like that lady who, who got two months of, uh, of, 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 of the TK tires and kinase inhibitor, um, like that's a big deal for her. She, she had a very uh, straightforward, post-operative outcome and that drug is actually already approved for three years in the post-operative setting why not why not just give it for a couple of two or three months before and make make the operation easier you can schedule surgeries more uh you're more at liberty to schedule things in a con convenient way rather than rushing or to the OR or whatever so I think all those things really should be taken into consideration I, I'm not I don't think they will. Like in Canada, they tend to look at overall survival exclusively almost. Um, but, uh, but I do agree that they should look at this. Wow. Yeah, so I like the, um, this outstanding talk, we're out of time. Um, really, really impressive. Um, uh, I'd like to thank John and, um, uh, and applaud him for incredible work that he's done. Thanks a lot, John, and uh, a very good talk. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Friends.